Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy, here with my co-host, Maddie B. A big win on Friday. I did notice that whenever your team wins, Scott Frost also wins. So I don't know if that means that um, his hot seat is tied to your season, but uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts after the game on Friday? Oh my goodness. It, I, I was so overly excited. And it's been it's been over a year, I think, since we've won our last game. So it was much needed and much appreciated. Uh, for those of you who were unfortunately unavailable to be there, uh, came down to a goal line stand late in the game, and defense defense stood tall. We had we had made the play that we needed, and I feel like for for the past year it was like we knew we'd get in. We were in situations where we knew the play was coming, and it was like you try to get a line as best as you can to put kids in a position to be successful. And this time they they, they were there. And they made the play when we needed them to. Yeah, I think. I mean, for me, it's crazy how. Last year seems like such a a weird season that like a lot of the stats that they throw out during the games, especially during college, because of how lopsided scheduling was, and even high school. Like, it's crazy to see think that only a handful of games were actually played last year. And then down here in North Carolina, they've been worried that is there going to be some type of effect on having two seasons in the same year. Because they played in the spring and then went right into it in the fall and they've been playing with only a couple months rest. So I wonder what type of impact that will have. I mean, obviously a much better move to just continue to play it on the regular schedule this year because you didn't want those athletes that are trying to get recruited to be on a totally different schedule than everyone else. But it's good to see that at least the schedule and consistency is back because I think that makes it easier for the athletes and everything all around. Um, but is there anything else you wanted to talk about, Matt? Yeah, I mean, it, it was the the first, quote, home game at the new stadium because we had to, like I said last week, we were, were playing road home games, and it was nice to be at, at our new space and – there was a, a pretty seamless transition, so uh, I was I was very fortunate that we were able to to partner with a local school and get in on the turf and have a really positive experience for that first win. Now, how much bigger were their stands than you're used to at home? The stands were a lot bigger just because we're, we're partnering with like a, a much larger school. Yeah, I just didn't know. It's hard to tell on TV how much bigger that was compared to your stadium because you guys didn't have a small section but I know most of your bleachers were on the one side yeah and and I think that'll be the way it'll continue because we're still we still have the way it's designed our football field and baseball field will be in a similar spot so during football season they'll have to move the portable bleachers for the away side yeah I know I hated that field because there are some times where I thought well, if I hit that ball at any other field, it's probably a home run because the way center field was set up. So <laughs> I know exactly where where you're talking, but um, cool. Well, uh, who you guys got this week? This week, we're, we're like the Mac. We're playing on Thursday. We got everything really? moved up. Yes. Why? Hurricane? I guess it's over, huh? <laughs> no, it's it's partly because of the the way that the facilities lined up with holidaysburg so we're on a short week and coming off of we had to bring the we brought the kids in on monday to go over film and practice we got through today tomorrow's walk through and we're, we're the greatest show in the area because we're the only show um so play machine and valley they're they're always a physically a lot bigger than we are up front so if we can control the line of scrimmage and, and continue working our ground game uh i think we have a chance to to get to that second win all right cool we'll be cheering for you good luck and yeah definitely thursday night i know nfl's back but you can only watch tom brady so many times right <laughs> if, if you guys are streaming again 
pop it on the old YouTube and check it out. CKTV, right? You're at home? Absolutely. All right. Yeah, we'll be sharing the link. Um, so go to southboundsports.com and you can check that out. Uh, in terms of the NFL, I, I don't want to go through uh, each game like like we've been doing on the schedule. So we're going to try to mix it up a little bit. But before we get into the prediction for the opening week, I want to talk about fantasy football, Matt. And mi- missing your draft, what do you think of that? Have you ever missed a draft? Mm, no. Yeah, me either. But I know that there are people out there that consistently make that mistake. And then uh, just throw out there trades for people that aren't even on a team. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a comment on that? I Typically, I would think that a person that is either making trades or <laughs> having their draft usually is looking to see when time frames are for start dates and end dates and things of that nature. I, that seems like a non-answer there. I'm just saying that when I look at a, a trade and I think, well, that could be collusion because one guy, his estimated point for the season total is zero. And then the other guy's averaging a nice six, seven points. So uh, if you were on the receiving end of one of those deals, wouldn't you be kind of suspicious? I might be. Because I, I think it was kind of funny that you didn't even know that Latavius Murray got cut by the Saints, did you? No. So you just accept random <laughs> trades? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because I know people listen, they have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. But I, I'm, I get this alert before the show. It's like, well, I know Latavius Murray gets cut by the Saints. A lot of people were expecting him to go to the Ravens, but the Ravens signed Le'Veon Bell. I don't even know if either of them fit the situation and what the Ravens are doing. I know Dobbins is there. Uh, we had a guy in our league that drafted Dobbins just so that they could use him as a keeper next year. And I thought, like, has he even shown enough to even have value for that? Like, why would you hold a guy the entire year? But um, that you don't know. It's not like you're holding uh, Christian McCaffrey or something where you know, like, oh, he has high value. Uh, I'm not sold on Dobbins yet. And I don't even know what the Ravens are going to do on the ground this year. But Murray, I don't even know at this point where he lands that he could be successful because he's always been a number two back with the Saints. And um, with that, what do you think of their fantasy production, like for Kamara? Because I was torn on drafting him. But with losing Breeze and then just going to Jameis, I think that's such a huge shift. I couldn't do it. Well, I I had initially liked Kamara, and I would have liked to. Uh, in my initial plan, was to to have him on my short list of, of players to sign, but with the auction style draft, his value went so high so fast that, that it was just like there's no way that I could I could commit three quarters of my salary to him. Oh, you're telling me. Because, uh, so I'll give you a recap of how my draft day went. It was over in about five minutes because, uh, we had some people that missed the draft and we're doing an auction. So I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, all right, the computer's going to auto bid these up to whatever the ESPN projected. We have 14 teams. So some of our values are way different than what people say. Like Matt Barry tells you that there's a sleeper guy. He's probably drafted in the middle of our draft. Like, there's no sleepers in our league just because of how deep it is. So I'm watching McCaffrey, and I had him last year, and I either had him for 81 or 83, but the value this year was 83, so I thought, oh, there's no way I'm letting someone miss a draft and get him for whatever price. So I bid up to, like, 81, and then I'm like, I'm done. I'm going to stop there. Someone can nab him for 82. That's a dollar, whatever, off. At least it's close to his, his a projected value. And then no one's bidding. So I'm like, what the hell? Bid. Bid. He was hurt all last year. So, of course, I get stuck with McCaffrey. <laughs> and then I don't know if it was the, the next pick exactly, which I think it was, right? I, I think it was back-to-back. The same exact shit happened. Yes. Where, um, 
Uh, well, let me just look and see. I, it was sixty something. I don't. I don't know the exact value. Uh, let me see. I can bring up my team right now. But Derrick Henry goes up, and I'm doing the same thing. I'm like, it's like, and I'm surprised for him to be honest, because I thought I don't know if people were just like, kind of waiting to see because it's a PPR league and he doesn't get a lot of receptions. But like, no one's no one's bidding, no one's bidding. So it's like sixty something. I'm like, I'm not letting someone nab him for fifty bucks, you know. And so I get it up to like sixty four, I think is what it was. And then no one bids, and I'm like, oh sh- shit! Like, come on, bid, bid! And then, and then it was like that was it. My draft is basically over. So I'm like, oh my god, are you kidding me? I don't even know what I was doing. But I ended up getting two running backs, so my team has no depth now. Because almost my entire budget after that, I think my max bid was maybe twenty bucks. So I'm sitting there for the next hour, just contemplating how can I redeem myself. And I don't think I did, to be honest. So, <laughs> but to be well, on last year, so last year I nailed it perfectly because I went big on McCaffrey. I know he ended up getting hurt, but then I settled in and I was able to get two medium running backs that that either of them didn't pan out. Um, Eckler and uh, who did I even have? I can't. I can't even remember. I think it was like, one of the guys from the Cardinals, um, but. Didn't work out, and everyone's getting injured. So I figured this year, if both my guys get injured, or if one of them gets injured, I'm basically done. I didn't even draft another running back till the end, and I picked up uh, Coleman from the from the Jets because I figured it, at this point, I there's no other number one running back I can get, so I might as well get him as an insurance policy. Uh, the only other two guys I tried to I tried to get Josh Allen, to be honest. But he was above my bed because you would have thought this is crazy. I was going to use the rest of my money. I had all $22 I think I had left on Josh Allen, and it got down to like three seconds left. And then he went up to like 25 So I would have had, <laughs> th- had three of the top guys from last year. Well, not Cotton McCaffrey because he was hurt, but Derek Henry is the number one running back, and then I would have had Josh Allen, the number one quarterback, and that would have been my entire team. But then, <laughs> but it didn't work out because then he went and I was able to get Mike Evans and Thielen, D-line, how do you pronounce it, the Vikings guy. And uh, yes. he's a pretty good value pick just because he gets a lot of action in PPR. And then uh, I ended up with Baker Mayfield. So that's my team. The rest of my guys are reaches and forgetfuls. I got like... Um, uh, every time I'd put a guy up for bid knowing that I had no money left at the end and it was $1, if someone bid it up, I would just be like almost crying because <laughs> I pick I pick my kicker. Someone picked the number one kicker. No one bid against him. I pick my kicker, immediately starts to get bids. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. No one bids on the number one guy, but they're like, oh, we'll take this random. I, it was the Falcons kicker that I had last year, Koo or you. Yeah. Uh, and so immediately I'm like, of course. I, same thing. Someone picks a high defense, no other bids. As soon as I bid mine up, I think people were just bidding me out of spite. And then, <laughs> so I end up with Jarwin, the Dallas tight end that was hurt last year, and at Uzuma from Cincinnati that I, I thought might be my smart play because I pit him, put him up. I did put up the uh, the Vikings tight end before the other one got hurt. So that would have been an amazing play. But, of course, he got bid, just like all my other nominations. Because for a while, I told you, what I was starting to do was just put up bids for people that I didn't want just to try to get people to run out of roster spots so I could just sneak my own picks in. (laughs) (laughs) But now I'm like, my team's projected pretty high just because of the crazy top two running backs. But then after that, if one of them goes down, my team will go from like one of the highest projections all the way down. ESPN had me in the middle of the, the pack for the draft. They had me at sixth, which is BS. They know I have a higher ceiling than that. Uh, but what were your what were your thoughts on the draft? How do you think it go for, went for you? Well, I thought overall it went okay. I, I was I was pleased that I was able to land the quarterback that I wanted. My man Jameis Winston back back where he needs to be. Oh man. So, 
Well, speaking of quarterbacks, I don't, I'm going to interrupt you here because I want to make sure that we're talking about fantasy plays. I know it sucks to hear someone talk about their fantasy team, but uh, one of the plays that I had, and I had planned it out, and I thought no one would even think about it, but then you stole him from me, Deshaun Watson. He was a top five quarterback last year. <clears throat> He's going to play this year. Like, I guarantee he plays. The uh-huh. Houston, Houston starting Tyrod Taylor. You got him for a dollar, the lowest bid. There was actually one guy that he turned off his draft in the middle, and he came back, and so he had a bunch of money, and I thought, if I nominate Deshaun Watson, he's not going to make it through. So I was waiting and waiting, and then you took it like two picks before I had it. I was like planning out all the roster spots. I was like doing tally marks to see how many openings people had. And I was about to pick him, and then you put him up, and I thought, damn, he's going to go through. <laughs> and you got him, and I think that's a great pick because I think right now, we'll see. I don't know how ESPN does it, but he might be able to sit on the IR. At least that's what I was hoping for. And then even yeah, if he doesn't, it's not like you can switch. Like if your starting quarterback gets hurt or whatever, it's not like you can't just pick someone else up, you know. So um, I ended up with Matt Ryan instead. Which is a late value. I'm surprised he was still there. People were reaching on so many other quarterbacks. It's like, are you serious? Like, Matt Ryan's legit a solid qu- quarterback that's always middle of the pack. So for the fact that I'm out of money and I'm able to land him. But yeah. I think the smart play, Deshaun Watson, definitely a top five. You get that ceiling. I think that was the best play in the draft value-wise. <laughs> and even like if you just want to sit and then hold him next year, because there's a chance he ends up with the Eagles or he ends up with another team that might have other pieces. Like, could you imagine if he ended up with the Broncos? They've been pretty close. They've kind of just been missing that quarterback spot. Yeah. I mean, that would be an, a hell of a landing spot. So kudos there, dude. You, you took my pick. but <laughs> Well, I stole him for a dollar, and I got Jameis Winston for $2. And, and I know everyone knocks him, but regardless of what he does with the Saints – the time that he had in Tampa, he he was a top five in yards, in touchdowns. Like, his fantasy production is going to be there. And I think having his experience in New Orleans, plus the fact that he got LASIK, like, he can actually see what's going on. I, I think he's going to be more improved. So that's Matt's sleeper pick, Jameis Winston. You've heard it here first. I'm saying Deshaun Watson or... Matt Ryan, that's probably a low value pick. Although I'm I'm sure teams have already picked those in either league. To be honest, I don't know though, because it's a weird year. Last year, some of those stats and like the Saints, they didn't go with them last year. This year, they're turning him over. He could burn out by week three. But and you know, you, you were saying about like some of the other picks, like picking up. Uh, Justin Tucker from the Ravens, and I got him for six bucks. Like I, I saw last year when you, I'd like bid for other players, and I got my defense and my kickers so much later. And those those are the the ones that really hurt you because for as as penalty heavy as the league is, if you don't get you can you can swing an easy 10 15 points just in your defense and kicking if you have the right people in place well to be fair i think the i'm going to go the opposite and I, not just for show banter but the past i'd say 3 or 4 years i've picked up one of the top 3 scoring kickers off waivers every year and like this year i just went with arizona's kicker because i think they're going to go high scoring and like I said, if I don't, then I won't get it. Defense is a tad bit tougher because you really have to pay attention to the matchups and the schedule. I went with the Colts this year because there was basically no defenses left. Um, I did bid on someone first, and of course they got stolen. I don't know if it was the Rams or if it was someone else. I can't remember who I put up for bid that I wanted above them. But even now, I mean, there's another play on defense that – uh, has projected score. So if you want, I mean, we're in an auction league. So if you don't have auction and you're just doing waivers, who cares? Just try to pick up the best scoring projected defense that week. And I guarantee you'll, you'll have a good solid thing. Cause I think a lot of people, they ride with their defense 
And if you have a defense from a solid team from last year, they're going to have a lot harder matchups. And um, one of them, one of the years I, I won the championship, I had the Eagles defense. And the Eagles sucked. The only re- reason I won is because their defense had so many turnovers. Like their offense was so bad that their defense had to produce turnovers to keep them in games. And so that was one where I lucked out. And like even last year, I picked up the Falcons kicker in the middle of the year. I don't think I had him all year. And the year before, I picked up how, who was it? I think it was uh, the Tennessee kicker. I just randomly picked him up because I saw that he was leading the league in kicking by week three and no one had picked him up. So I thought, you know what? I'll, I'll spend a dollar. Got him, and then I just rolled with him. And it was like he had one of the early bye weeks too, I think. I think it was them. It might have been someone else, but I know it was Falcons last year because I looked, and that, that's who I was going to go with again. But I didn't get him. But those are two. I, I go on the opposite. Same with tight end too because I mentioned how I picked up the tight ends. If you can't get Kelsey, because if Kelsey was available, he was kept in our league, my draft strategy, I never would have even risked bidding on those those running backs. Because Kelsey scores so much higher than all the other tight ends that it doesn't even matter. Like, I've seen people talk about it on Twitter. Like, hey, should I trade Kelsey for, like, this other tight end combo? It's like, no. You, you can't replace <laughs> his value. Anyone else, they're averaging between, like, 5 to, th- to 12 points. Kelsey's averaging, like... 15 to 20 at least in ours so it's like he's scoring so many more points it's like why why would you even risk it he's worth the extra money because there's no other tight end that if you're playing a required tight end if you're only playing flex or something it it doesn't matter but we have a one tight end spot so if you can get him great and i think that's why whoever has him is just going to keep him forever but the rest of them just try to find a tight end one that might be able to get you a, a couple tight ends i had the guy tanyan is that how you pronounce it from the Packers last year? Yeah. he. I picked him up off waivers. And then a couple years before, I had picked up one of the Browns tight ends that had a solid year. So I think tight end's another position where, and that's why I'm hoping the Bengals one pays off. Joe Burrow was hurt. Uh, he was on the field like 60% of his snaps. People had no idea who the hell he was and why I was nominating him so early probably. But I'm hoping that with Burrow coming back, he needs an outlet. Go get him. Give me some points, baby. That's in a PPR. <laughs> if it wasn't PPR, I would say no no dice. Don't even try to get him. But I'm thinking he's going to check down to him at least five times a game. Give me 10 points or so. I'll be happy. Um, anything else you have? Fantasy tips? Well, I, I thought it was interesting that you said about the tight ends because I, I think, and obviously because of my drafting strategy, I've I've had years where I've had success going the tight end route if you get a run on wide receivers. So like this year, I felt like I'd gotten decent value for picking up Kyle Pitts from Atlanta, who ha- is going to have the the potential for yardage because of Julio Jones going to the Titans, and Hawkinson from Detroit because I figure Dan Campbell's a former tight end, so he's going to I I would assume that if they're going to go with more of those those heavier sets and the tight end is going to be involved by default. So uh, those, those were two that I went with and knowing that in the past I've gone with the two tight end, tight end slash flex role and it, it, it has worked out well. So I think you can get away with it, but you have to make sure that you have the two tight ends that are going to be seeing uh, a decent amount of targets per game. That's why I just waited and did the – like I went with Dallas and, like I said, Cincinnati because Dallas had the two tight end system. And I actually had Schultz last year that I picked off off waivers. And he filled in after Jarwin got hurt. So I figured let's just go with the guy that was better than him last year. you know. Uh, but my, t- my wide receiver strategy, after I got my two boom guys, Evans and Thielen, I went with number two r- wide receivers. I went with Hardman from the Chiefs because Sammy Watkins isn't there anymore. And I got Gage from the Falcons. I know you like the Falcons, dude. Holyo's not there anymore. So those guys should see an uptick in production. Uh, I also went with uh, Cobb because Aaron Rodgers specifically asked for him to come back to the Packers. And so I thought that might work out. And then I got two rookies. I think I think Mooney is a rookie for the Bears. And then Rondell Moore with the uh, 
Arizona. So then I could figure one of those rookies, hopefully if they go out and they, they impress, I have some moving parts I can move around. It's really just running back set. I have two studs, another number one, and then I'm going to be picking up whoever the Ravens go with, I guess. Unless it's Murray because you already traded him away. <laughs> well, I told you my other strategy too is I got two two studs. So if one of them gets hurt, I could probably do a two for one and still have a pretty solid team. Because I'm confident that my tight end moves, because no one else had like notes like me and wide receivers, I'm pretty sure that they're going to, at least some of them are going to pan out. And unless Baker Mayfield blows up, but then like I said, I already have. Uh, Matt Ryan, and he's been serviceable for me in the past, so I trust him. The only other move I would have had is tr- trying to keep Russell Wilson for $3. But ev- the past three years, around week 12, his stats have fallen off, which is right around playoff time, so I couldn't risk it. I don't know if he's getting too old, you know, or like if they go into like a conservative Pete Carroll mode around that time. <laughs> but I did notice a trend that like the last couple years, he starts really, really hot. And then right around playoff time, he falls off. And at that point, I'm kind of like not ready to make a move. There's not really any guys left. Do you bench him or do you hope that he gets hot again and he never gets hot again? So I spared myself the heartbreak and just got rid of him before the draft. Um, But that's all I had. Do you have anything else for fantasy? No, I don't. All right. So I said we're we're not going to go through the exact NFL predictions, but I wanted to just go through – and get playoff predictions, and uh, I'm thinking of doing this for college too. Maybe we could focus on, like, I pick a game of the week and you pick a game of the week, and maybe one sleeper team to look out for. But let's just go through, for the NFL today, we'll do uh, the playoff predictions since we haven't done it. Uh, Let's go through, we'll do the AFC East first. Who do you think wins that division? (laughs) That's a. I feel like it. It's hard to go with with any. I want to say buff Buffalo. I'm going with Buffalo. Just it's been New England for so long that I feel like they finally get over the hump. Didn't Buffalo win it last year? They did for the first time in like a gazillion years. Yeah, and I think they're locking it in. There's not even a debate. I don't think any other team is going to even be close. You might be able to say the Dolphins because they were right there last year, and I think they fell off late. And I don't think they even missed the playoffs completely, but that one's the Bills for me. Uh, A more competitive division, though, Mm -hmm. AFC North, who do you have? I am going to go with... I'm gonna. Tr- I'm not gonna be a homer this time. I'm gonna go with Cleveland. I think that they have. They're there. Their time is right now to win it. With Baltimore having running back issues, the Bungles being the Bungles, and Pittsburgh having the the off the field stuff, like running over milk crates and worried about contracts. I, I I think this is Cleveland's time to capitalize. Oh damn! I have Cleveland too, and that's why I picked Baker Mayfield. I think I had Josh Allen first for the Bills. And then I think Baker Mayfield, this is his year. Bengals, rookie quarterback. Uh, I mean, basically, he was out all last year. He played only a little bit. Ravens. I thought he played well, though, and in that's the time why, that he had. That's why I picked his tight end, Matt. I think he'll be well, but I don't think it's enough to win the division your first year really playing. Yeah. It, that's not a winning franchise. It's not like he's stepping into the Patriots, you know? I think if he was in a different situation, it might be different. But the Steelers, I still think Ben gets hurt or something happens there. And the Ravens, too many. It's not really injuries just on the running back. I, I think that they're kind of out of an identity. And then I know that they lost. They had a bunch of defensive staff turnover that went to Michigan. And so they seemed pretty well in their first game. And I wonder if the Ravens are going to be missing those younger guys on the staff. So I'm going with the Browns. Uh, AFC South. Hmm. Titans. You're not going to go with Urban Meyer? If he wins with (laughs) the issues that he's having, then I will change my opinion about him. But see, okay, 
I'm going to, I'm going to bring this up. So, you know how I always said, like for college, Urban Meyer was such good buddies with the ESPN guys and the Fox guys from doing the college circuit all that time that I think that a lot of that light was more of like a college, like, Hey, we're buddies. We're, it's like a college, like, um, community. We know you. We're going to help get your back. The NFL, it's a little bit different. It's kind of like an older gentleman's type club where it's like, hey, Admiral, 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 you know, like how they have those uh, like air, <laughs> airline like clubs or whatever. That's kind of what it's like. Like you're kind of just born into that. You're not just going to get admitted and be like, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to do this now. That's why like all these coaches are like, hey, this is my son. Here's a picture of my dad coaching the Packers in 1962. It's like, oh. So you you just your dad just got you into coaching like oh yeah sure for the NFL didn't even play football at all I'm just here <laughs> coaching that's the NFL for you so like for Urban Meyer to make that jump and not have the history in the NFL like Pete Carroll he had already failed in the NFL he failed in the NFL he came back um, after he was successful at USC Jim Harbaugh he went from college to the NFL but guess what he had already played in the NFL for years. Like he was a longtime NFL player, worked on some staff before taking the San Diego job, I think was his first job. So like when guys like that, when they come back that have been in the league, but Urban Meyer has never been in the league. So he has no connections. He doesn't have family there. And I think that's the big difference. I don't think, I mean, I think this division's a lock for the Titans just because of who's not there. Colts are having trouble with quarterbacks. Texans having trouble with quarterbacks, and then you have a brand new head coach. So it'd be idiotic. I'm, I hate we're picking the same teams across the board because that's most likely never going to happen. But I will say right there that the AFC, I, I don't think that there's really any discussion. I think you can just kind of pick. It's kind of like the SEC where you know Alabama's going to win and, and possibly most likely Georgia on the east side. And everyone's like, oh, well, don't you think these other teams? Like, no, they're much more talented than the other teams. That's kind of how the AFC is for me. I think it's Bills, Browns, Titans, and then the Chiefs out west. I know we didn't talk about the west yet, but the Chiefs are still there. Andy Reid has th- things together. That That's how I feel about it. There, There's no connection with some of these other teams where they're all missing pieces. Unless like a Deshaun Watson – Ends up with the Broncos. I could see them sneaking in. The Raiders, I think, would kind of be close. But for me, just not there yet. What do you think? Well, I I think they're going to make strides progressively. If you look over the last couple of years, the the offense has been improving. And they're they're within the top 10 offensive units in the league. But the issue that they had was that the defense was so, so terrible that they were one of the worst and they gave up so many points that like if the offense didn't outscore the other team there it was there there was no support so i think it it was necessary to to upgrade the defense and and i think bringing in Gus Bradley who has experience with like Pete Carroll style system that that i think that they're going to get the they're going to have the plays that they need to to even if they cut they cut their defensive position from like one of the worst to middle of the pack. I think they become more competitive within the division. Who do you think wins that division, though? I think it's it's Kansas City's to lose right now. They have one of the best quarterbacks in the league, and it's a quarterback friendly league. So I mean, as long as he stays healthy, um, I, I have a hard time believing that it's going to be anyone else but them. All right. What about the NFC East? Riverboat Ron. Washington. It's got to be Washington. The Washington Admirals. The Washington Fitzpatricks. I'm going to go with, and this is going to seem crazy, I'm going to go with the Cowboys. I think Prescott's back. They're going to have something to prove. That division is still going to be a mess. Cowboys almost won it without him last year. I think if he's there last year, they easily win it. And so that that's where I'm going with. I, I'm, the Eagles are a mess. Giants, I don't know what they're doing with the front office and stuff. They've made some moves. 
So I think they would be the next closest. I, don't, I think Washington takes a seat back. Uh, what about the NFC North? Um, I'm going to have to go with much as I'm going Minnesota. I'm going to go wild card here. Let I'm going to Alvin Cook run wild. You don't think he's going to get hurt? Uh, I'm going to say he's not going to get hurt. Because that's where I think, I mean, everyone had Henry projected like fourth or fifth running back. And I think that's how I kind of lucked into him, not going as high as what he probably should have. Because I think a lot of people were high on Dalvin Cook and Kamara and um, maybe even Saquon Barkley coming back. But I'm going to go with Packers. I think Aaron Rodgers proves his worth. They don't win it. Of course, they're not going to win the NFC. But they'll, he'll win the North again. Everyone will talk about him, and this will be his last year there. Whatever is going on, hopefully Cobb has 800 touchdowns, and it really works out for me in fantasy. I'm just saying that the Packers win that one. Um, NFC South, who do you have? Uh, I guess we'll go with your boy. Tom Brady. Yeah. You know that's who I'm picking. I'm just going to go ahead and just skip mine. To the Super Bowl winner, it's Tom Brady. I think he beats the Bills. That's my prediction. Tom Brady, a double repeat. Everyone's minds just explode. And they're like, oh my gosh. Bill Belichick has <laughs> another crappy season, maybe only five wins. Uh, Mac Jones is like, he's struggling out there. Everyone's like, it was Tom Brady. Bill Belichick sucks. And you see a bunch of articles about how Bill Belichick has a really bad losing record without Tom Brady. And Tom Brady, I mean, he was out there. He admitted that he got coronavirus when he was drinking all that uh, alcohol after the Super Bowl, and he celebrated too hard. So now he's vaccinated, so he's good to go, Matt. He has the natural antibodies, and he has the vaccination. Their, their team's 100% <laughs> vaccinated. He has them all on board. He's eating healthy. Back to back champs. <laughs> My God! All right, Hulk Hogan. Is he take? <laughs> is he saying his prayers or taking his vitamins? <laughs> hey, you know, people have been calling him out on that diet, but hey, uh, it's working for him. He's like forty something years old. He's e- even older. At, didn't he just have a birthday? I don't, I don't know when his birthday is. I can't remember. Uh, but oh, like you don't have it in your date book? Well, that's what I was thinking. Like, did I get an, an alert recently? <laughs> but I think it was like uh, in the beginning of August. I could be wrong. Uh, but I will say that I think just hands down, if he wins it, there's not even any debate ever. Like Mahomes could go on a on a streak and win like one more Super Bowl than him. But just the fact that like he took a team that hadn't even made it and if he wins back to backs with them, it's crazy. But I don't want to talk about Tom Brady anymore. Let's get to the NFC West. Who do you have there? Oh, uh... I am going to go with the Rams. I think having Stafford back and being in a good place, I think I think that'll be who it, who's going to take it. I think it's going to be the Seahawks again. I think that I think they won it last year. I could be wrong, but the division's such a tough division that oh, I think Wait a minute. It's it's Arizona. This is the Cardinals. No way. They have, They have Hopkins. They have A.J. Green. I don't care how many people you You're adding a bunch of old wide receivers. Who are you, the 2002 Raiders? No. (laughs) You're the 2020 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And they added rookie Rondell Moore. I'm hoping that he really pans out for me. So A.J. Green, he's not going to stay healthy. Let's be be honest. Um, I don't think the Cardinals, because I don't think Kingsbury is a good coach. Like Kyler Murray, he had a great year last year. I honestly, I've been, I don't, th- I didn't think he was going to stay healthy. He has been doing fairly good in that regard, and I think it starts to catch up to him at some point. He's just too small. I don't think he can take a, a beating like that. Like, unfortunately, I think he's like near the tail end of his career, and it's still young. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I don't want anyone to ever get hurt. But uh, Kingsbury, I, I just don't think that. Some of the decisions that they've made, yeah, they're bringing in a bunch of big time guys that can get you around the win. But like, how about you get some playoff wins? Did they even make the playoffs yet? 
Like you don't go from barely making the playoffs to like winning the division and then making a deep run. Like you have to have that experience somewhere along the way, and they don't have it. That's why I'm going yeah. Seahawks. Seahawks have it. They have Russell Wilson. I mean, they toyed around with him. Could you imagine if he would have went to the Bears? I would have been picking the Bears. But for whatever reason, they worked things out. He has Metcalf. He's ready to go. I'm saying Seahawks. Um, I already gave my prediction for the Super Bowl. Bucks over Bills. And I kind of like the Bills. I remember when I was, I was in first grade, I picked him to win the Super Bowl, and they really let me down. So I'm waiting for that redemption. It never happened. I like their red, white, and blue, very America. But you can't beat Tom Brady. He probably wears an American shirt under his jersey anyway. <laughs> Who do you I have? Who do you have in the Super Bowl? I like... Actually, all things considered, I do like the Bills. I think they have enough that they can do it. Do you think they'll they win secure it? Home, they secure home field advantage. I think they're going to lose it to the Saints. I think Jameis is going to have that cyborg vision. Are you serious? I don't even have the Saints making the playoffs. That, that's exactly the way we want it. Write them off. Leave them for dead. Well, hold on. I thought you were a secret Falcons fan slash Raiders fan. My allegiance to the Falcons was only there because of Julio. No, bullshit. I, I saw your team. draft. I saw you nominating all those Falcons players. I nominated Pitts. <laughs> I no, no, I didn't even nominate Pitts. I just bid on him because he was less than seventy dollars. Overpaid for him. I saw you I going did. up. I didn't have money for once. My money was out. I'm like, oh, shit. That's an overpay. <laughs> why are people well, bidding look- all these up? I should have made a comment like, why is everyone bidding all these up? But we had dudes <laughs> drafting three quarterbacks. I was like, we had a bunch of other stuff going on that was just blowing my mind. I don't know, but you think the Saints are going to make it after losing Drew Brees? Yeah, I, I think they are. I, I, I really, I, I think that they have. Is it the Hurricane? I, I think they they are Super Bowl champs in Hurricane season. Is that why you're going with them? You think that they're going to have another? What? But they had that bounty gate, didn't they? They did. They don't do well, that. What, you, what, you, you think they can't do that again? <laughs> they haven't won since Matt. Until until now, just like the, everyone talked about Spygate with the Patriots. Do you think Tom Brady was doing that spying? I think it was Belichick, right? No, it was Eric Mangini. Either way, he you know he got the marching orders from the guy who can't <laughs> win without him. Oh goodness! Um, anything else you have for the season upcoming? What are you looking for? Any other big teams you think are going to be a breakout team? I, I think you kind of touched on it already. Just seeing what what the Texans look like and what ends up playing out with Deshaun Watson because I th- I think that they have to either move forward with the charges and and proceed or give them the clearance to be able to. To continue playing, like leaving them in this limbo state is kind of like a, a bad spot. Well, see, he went to Clemson. There's been real big rumors down here that the Carolina Panthers are interested. That's kind of one of the reasons why I was like, eh, end up with McCaffrey, not a big deal, because I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up in Carolina. He's playing, and that's, that's a big one-time punch, one-two punch for that offense. He hasn't had a running back. I mean, I guess he had David Johnson, uh, but that was like post-David Johnson, right? That was after he had those big years? Because didn't he have them with the Cardinals? Yes. Yeah, so he had like the the slower version of David Johnson, the one that was jumping out of pools after the knee injury. But having McCaffrey, I think that would be a whole new game for him. And maybe that can get him into some more of those running, passing type options and stuff that he was used to in college. And I think that that would just explode. And that would be my sleeper team. Even without him, I think if the Panthers can stay healthy, their defense has been playing lights out, it seems. And I think Matt Rule can do enough on offense that he can get that team going. 
That's who I would pick. That's why I don't have the Saints going. I think it's going to be the Bucks and Panthers out of that division. And, of course, the, the Bucks just take it all. So that's my thing. Uh, any, anything else you wanted to hit on NFL-wise? No. I mean, the Steelers play the Bills. That's my game of the week because, like I said, I'm picking the Bills, and I think this is going to be the big week where you're seeing Roethlisberger. You need to know if he's real or not. And so for my game of the week, check that one out, 1 p.m. on Sunday. I think the Bills are going to win it. Steelers don't play good on the road. I think Ben battles back, and he plays a solid game. But I just think that this sets a tone for the Bills making a run for that Super Bowl appearance. Do you have a game you're watching this week, Matt? Um, I just want to just watch whichever ones the NFL is going to allow me to watch. Because of their schedule? Because of the schedule. Well, the Thursday night game, I think, see, if they can keep the streaming and stuff going on Thursday night where you can watch it on Amazon or you can watch it over the air, if they start to shove stuff on NFL Network, that's when I get annoyed. Shoving stuff on ESPN, and this is going to lead me into the college talk, so you can cut me off if you want. But um, I'll say this, that like ESPN started to put out their bogus like propaganda about how Football has had like this many viewers and we're going to narrow it down to like the Sunday. Hey, um, here, this Sunday Notre Dame game, our best viewers, our second best viewers all time since 1996. We'll put that in there as a disclaimer only on Sundays. It's like, who wrote that? Who wrote that BS story where you're talking about um, our best TV viewers only on Sunday past 1996? Like, you, you, you know, you had games before that. Like, why not just have all time and be like, hey, that was our 10th most watched game or whatever? Or was it that bad when you had all those older years? Or maybe they just didn't have it on Sunday, which then would be true. Like, why not just have that 1996 thing out of there? Just say it's our second most watched Sunday game. Uh, And that's where, like, the NFL, like, I think that, and I, I was talking to someone over the weekend about this too, because you have streaming. When they do stream the games, they still don't play commercials on them you're watching the game i'm watching espn they show the black screen that says like we're in a commercial break well your game will resume shortly and i just sit there thinking like i would rather watch a commercial at this point like you yeah. can make more money if it's going to help your team like if it's going to help the big 10 or even the acc or whatever team i'm watching just show a commercial and i almost wonder if it's because they know that the viewers are less than what they're talking about Because with television, too, and the coronavirus definitely affected this, whenever they had bars, they kind of estimate how many people are watching sports in bars. They don't know. So they might just say, like, hey, this many Buffalo Wild Wings locations, we're going to estimate that a couple million people watched there. They just add that into the tally. Like, they legitimately, like, their stats say that it's an average or estimate or whatever. For some of them. So there's a baseline where like some of those games where they're really low. I wonder how much of those are just their bar projections. Like those games that have like 50, 500,000 or whatever. Is that really yeah. even anyone watching? Or is that just because so-and-so reported that they had that on at the bar? You know? <laughs> so that's why I, I just hope the NFL would just come through. They, they advertised it like, hey, you can watch it on your phone. Or all this stuff, but then there's always like these like stipulations, like only at 1 p.m. for 10 minutes, and then you have to pay for this other service. It's like, come on, make it easy for me. Uh, but there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about first that annoyed me, and I don't know if you watched the game last night, Ole Miss and uh, Louisville. Yeah, four targeting ejections, and I actually had this in my notes to bring into the show from the Ohio State game on Thursday. So Ohio State and Minnesota were playing. Minnesota is trying to catch up. And I I talked about this last year because it hurt the Browns, where you have a player, catches the ball, he tries to make a play, clearly gets hit in the head. Clearly. It's so clear that he's knocked out, Matt. And you know what? Whenever you get knocked out, guess what? You fumble the ball. (laughs) <laughs> so the ball is just laying there between his legs. Like that's how ridiculous and that this looked and how bad it was for the big 10 
that they have a guy that's basically knocked out cold. The ball's laying between his legs. Ohio State picks it up and basically ends the game. They go to a review. Well, actually, they said he was down. So they go to the review to rub the salt in the wound. And then they reverse the call and say that it was a fumble. Because when he got knocked out cold, he was still standing up. And the ball just kind of just dribbled between his legs and the Ohio State guy picked it up. So they're like, Ohio State ball. Uh, but we didn't review it for targeting because it wasn't called on the field. And I thought, what are they talking about? Are they protecting the players or not? And then, as I was coming in, I was going to come in hot and all fired up and talk about how the Big Ten, like, are they just protecting Ohio State at this point? Because that was such a bullshit call that it was like, you just took the excitement from the end of the game where Minnesota was driving. Even the announcers were like, what are you doing? Like, why would you even give them the ball? Like, the targeting should negate the fumble, and it should be Minnesota ball with an extra 15 yards. Even if you don't call the targeting, don't call the fumble. Like, do the right thing. Some guy on the field, like, is it is it the announcer on the field that's making the asshole call? That's like, yeah, I'm going by the book. <laughs> like, like, do you want fans to watch the game? Because if I wasn't a football fan and I watched that, I would be like, this is like WWE shit. Why would I watch this? Like, why would I watch it? And I, and honestly, I turned it off after that because I had said, there's no way Minnesota's coming back. You can't beat the refs and you can't beat Ohio State at the same time. And then last night, I watched it. Four ejections. And I didn't even know what to do because there was one where... The old Miss quarterback, he started to slide. Matt, I don't know if you saw this play. Half a second. It was he was such a shitty slide that both defenders were were called for targeting and they had to review to see which one to eject. Yeah. Like he ran it right up the middle <laughs> and I thought like just put in the rule book that if the slide is not completed, he's not a defenseless player. You can't like just because you're the quarterback you just can't slide as you're getting hit. And and because he did try to slide, that's what drew the head to head com like head to head hit. Because the defender, I mean, to be fair, I've been saying don't put your head down. They put their heads down, so there's no way they knew that he even started to slide until they probably felt the helmet the helmet hit. But I don't even know what the NF- NCA can do because it was so bad last night that it basically ruined the game. All those ejections, and then it made me think. Well, I can't use my defender putting their head down because in half of those, the offensive guy put their head down and initiated the contact. So what am I supposed to do? It's almost like if you're the coach, like, man, I don't even know how you would coach him, Matt. Do you have any insight on that? No, because those those are the games that I find most frustrating is when the officials – call things in such a way that it it takes away from the flow of the game. And actually, I commented to the officials at our game this past week because we've had the same officiating crew the first two weeks on the road and at home. And I said – and I told them after the game, I said, you know, the thing that I like most about you guys is that with, with a lot of crews, you have to deal with people trying to make it more about them. And so, like, the officials were throwing flags and, and calling these ticky-tack things. And it was just – it was a lot – it's better when you just allow the kids to play and you're, you're calling it consistently. Was what's a penalty – and the blatant, obvious ones, you know, I, I think are the ones that that, that I, I like to see. I think when you find yourself in these spots where you're, you're dealing with – are, are they going to call it? Are they not – what are we going to do with this? Like, it, it takes away from from the game. And I thought it was interesting for for as hard as they push this narrative that oh, Lane Kiffin, he has a hundred percent compliance with vaccination rates, and his team just following protocols. He had to miss the game because he had COVID. So, like, all all of these extra additional measures that they're trying to put into play, uh, it didn't matter. He, had, he still got COVID. And they said that, I mean, he was joking around with it after the game saying, like, I knew I was sick, but I thought maybe I don't get tested. And then it was like, well, he did get tested. But, like, if you're sick, why not just, like, stay home? I mean, I I don't know. Like, it was very confusing. And then, like, he wasn't even in the booth. 
but it's like they have how many boxes at those stadiums? They couldn't give him an empty booth to coach in. He free spent the beginning of the year in a bed. So, and this goes back to where I don't know if you were intending this, but like when you talk about the refs, I honestly think that they just need to take the power out of their hand and they need to get a guy in the booth. I've been saying this for years. I think it's the only solution. You need a neutral guy that can sit there because when you're listening to the television broadcast and they're making the most sense by saying like, oh, Minnesota guy, he caught the ball. He went to turn up field. They speared him in the head. That should not be a fumble because the helmet, the helmet caused a fumble. And they were even saying like, don't even inject them. Just make them sit for the rest of the series. Like, I think that that would still be impactful. And then that gives the guy a chance to learn. It's not as harsh, but if you have a guy in the booth, it has to be faster than what they've been doing. Having the one guy go over, watch it on the television console, that takes forever. Forever. Just have one guy in the booth. You already have how many guys in the booth? Just get a guy with balls that's up there that's going to say, like, no. Minnesota's ball, they're still driving. This is still going to be a game. We're not letting Ohio State get out of here because of a, a freak helmet to helmet that we didn't get caught on the field because the guy missed it. And then, like, last night, too, same thing. I would have been in the booth saying, no. Quarterback started to slide. He did not get into the full initiation. He waited too long. That is not helmet to helmet. That is not helmet to helmet. Those guys are not ejected. Some of the other ones, too, it's like, all right, they might have hit with the helmets. Just keep the heads up. But then the same thing, I don't want to see the offensive players doing it because I think at this point, they're the ones that are initiating some of the contact and it's getting defensive guys kicked out of games. And it's very strange. They're almost incentivizing the offensive player to do the head-to-head hit, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's my thought of it, and I don't want to talk about it anymore, but that's the only way I think they can solve it is if they bring a guy in the booth <clears throat> and, and they do it. But as a coach, like I don't envy coaches that are trying to uh, teach their players what to do because I don't think that there's really any right thing that they can do. Um, my last thing, <laughs> my main college football topic, the end Danina jerseys. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Did you see this? Yeah. So Indiana comes out against Iowa and their social media team, Indiana's own social media teams tweets out a picture of one of their guys running out of the, the tunnel he had a jersey where Indiana was spelled wrong. And and Ania, jer- like that was just on the jersey. And I thought, like, I know you're on the. I think it was in Iowa, right? So I think yeah. I know they're on the road. But some of those jerseys, like the equipment guy, packs all those, and it didn't look like they were all misspelled. So it's kind of like probably a, a guy that wasn't going to play. They're like, hey, we need you to switch jerseys. Like they say, Indonina on them. <laughs> he's like no no not not the Indianina ones I can't wear that I'll be embarrassed and then not only did he wear it he ran out of the tunnel and they shared it on social media and then when people pointed out they deleted it and tried to hide it but I thought I've seen stuff like that happen where it's like oh we brought the wrong jerseys so and so backup you're wearing the backup one and we're going to switch you but they have numbers and names on them so did he just bring the wrong one himself? I don't know. There's so many questions that weren't answered. But <laughs> he that's, brought his Indonesia jersey. <laughs> that's how college football went. And so just to pull out some of like the crazy things that have happened. So Indiana was one of the to- teams that everyone had picked to go far this year. They got blown out by Iowa so bad that now they're not even ranked. And the crazy thing is uh, North Carolina lost in embarrassing fashion, still ranked. I don't think you could watch the North Carolina game and say that they were any better than Indiana at that point. I mean, Virginia Tech was definitely not as good as Iowa. They looked like their offense was so inconsistent that uh, I'm going to say my biggest winner from this week is Iowa. Because Indiana, or not India, Indiana got killed by them. Iowa State looked like absolute shit. I watched that game in my dull TV setup. And they couldn't even move the ball ball on North Iowa. Iowa State barely moved down in the polls. They dropped from 7th to ninth. So Iowa has a chance to crush a top 10 team after blowing out ranked Indiana to start their season 
to set up a run where Wisconsin already lost to Penn State. So even if Wisconsin beats Iowa, the only other game that's going to be tough for Iowa is the Penn State game that they get at home, and they've been able to handle Penn State recently. I know that there's been some tougher games that they might have lost. So the Iowa State game... Wisconsin and Penn State are the only three ranked games that are left for Iowa. Iowa has a chance to, let's say they lose one of those. And I mean, even if it's Iowa State this week, which I think that they're going to roll Iowa State, they picked that for game day. And I think that's the only reason why Iowa State didn't drop in the rankings because they were like, oh, we're already too far into this. But they were very close to losing. Um, So my biggest winner, Iowa. I think that they're in a position now where Wisconsin's been exposed. Their offense can't even kick field goals, can't even carry the ball. They're fumbling. They're throwing interceptions. They looked like they were a mess, and they still should have beat Penn State. And they still threw interceptions at the end of the game. Like, what are you doing? Like that, They should have easily beat Penn State. Yeah. And so I think Iowa's better than both of them te- those teams. So that, that's my biggest winner from this weekend. I think Iowa sets it up, and, and they're ready to make a run. I don't know if they'll be they, – I mean, a Big Ten championship against Ohio State doesn't look good for them just in terms of talent. But in terms of making a New Year's Six game, possibly the Rose Bowl if it's not in the playoffs, hell of a good chance. Um, who do you think had, were the biggest winner from this weekend? Well, we talked about it last week. I feel like the, the winner of the weekend was Florida State. And they the they didn't record, even win though. The record is showing zero and one, but let, let's wind the clock back a little bit to the year of our Lord twenty eleven. They played Florida State played at Oklahoma at home and lost, and they didn't get blown out of the water. So what did it do? It set the table that showed that the transition from Bobby Bowden to Jimbo Fisher was going to be a solid one. It showed that they the organization, the structure, the programming was there compete on that level i think you're looking at the same thing where we talked about it last week that i wanted to see florida state win obviously however it was don't get absolutely throttled by notre dame and it was interesting to hear the commentators during the game be like yeah we we knew that this was going to be the way it was and then as florida state came back was like trying to like make it seem like they weren't just completely biased a, a, a couple minutes earlier but i feel like they they found some solid footing with Mackenzie Milton. I think their quarterback situation is pretty much solved. I think they that going forward, they have the grounds now. As long as they don't lay an egg to someone like Jacksonville State this coming weekend. <laughs> they, that's you when know, your like, biggest winner would become the biggest loser. That That's the way that you lose the momentum that you have. Because right now, like you, you play tough in the games. You keep them close. And now you have that recruiting edge that they had a lot of like four and five star guys on camp. Like they sold out for this and they gave, they showed the environment. They showed they were able to to put out there what the product is. And it looked like a different team than what has been, been put out on the field. And, And I even commented to my wife that like they didn't win, but that was the most enjoyable game that I've watched Florida state play in probably the last five years. That's interesting you say that because they still look pretty bad. But there were still like there were still times where they're running plays and it's not like what are you doing? Like they're, they're, you could kind of see like what the intent was and, and maybe the execution wasn't perfect, but but it's getting closer to where it needs to be or where it should be. Well, I'm going to give you my thoughts on those, but in a second. Uh, I want to talk about the Big 12 first. So my other biggest winner, Texas. Because Iowa State looked like shit, of course. So did Oklahoma. I don't know how Oklahoma's still in the top five. I would not have them above A&M. And I, to, to be fair, I don't even know if I would have them above Clemson. Um, but I'm going to save the Clemson talk for the ACC stuff. But I will say, Texas possibly has a chance now to just win the Big 12, go out on top if the rumors are true where they could leave next year or the year after. Uh, they were bit, The Big 12 was supposed to be... So they met yesterday, I think, on Labor Day. 
to talk about BYU, UCF, Cincinnati, and who else? There's a fourth team I'm forgetting. Houston, maybe? I don't know. That sounds right. It, it might not be them, but they had four teams that they were discussing. They didn't make a vote on it yet, but I mean, as soon as they expand, I think that that gives Oklahoma and Texas an out to get out. So, like, it would be really crazy if Texas ran the table somehow, like, even if they would, like, I mean, Sarkeesian, I've been against just because, not as a coach, but just how he failed at USC. I mean, I'm all for a guy getting a second chance, but I just don't think that he's able to take them to the top. But it would be hilarious if Texas won a national championship only to go to the SEC and then go 6-6 six and six next year. <laughs> and then, like, imp- like, just the rest of the way out, like, never come close again. Where I was like, "What are you guys doing? You had a chance. It was you. You. It was you the whole time. Your your, your team sucked. Now that you guys won, you jumped conferences and started getting killed. Um, but I think that that's going to be one of the things to watch is how how does the Big Twelve have the perception as they're known as one of the weakest conferences? Their two teams barely win. I mean, if that was the Big Ten, they would have been dropping. Like if Michigan had a close game like that." They would have dropped five to ten spots in the pool. I mean, Michigan killed Western Michigan, and they're still receiving votes in the middle. So it's like, all right, uh, a lot of the other Big Ten teams, I think, dropped out. But for whatever reason, they're like, no, we can't just have only one Big Twelve team here. We we still we picked Oklahoma for the playoff. We still got to keep them in that number four spot. And they played Tulane, and Tulane's not even that good. So like, at that point, like, what do you look at? Um, but my other thing for football, I think. For right now, we're going to focus kind of on the alliance. And so I'm going to go through each of those conferences. UCLA was my pick to watch for the Pac-12, and they they panned out. I think their quarterback, if he's able to keep the ball and get the offense going, I think Chip Kelly can really take them. Oregon is not there. Oregon looked bad. They had their best player go down. I think he was like the NFL predicted one. Uh, Thibodeau, or I don't know how he pronounces it. But um, he went out. They're going to go to Ohio State. Ohio State, surprisingly, Matt, they have 10,000 tickets available for the game next weekend. They're playing, or- they're playing Oregon. They put out an announcement from their athletic director. He said that they have 10,000 seats available, which is crazy, right? They're a top five team. How do they have that many tickets available? Meanwhile, Nebraska said that they had to boost their pay. Uh, their boosters are going to buy the rest of their tickets for the rest of the year to keep their sellout streak alive. How embarrassing is that? How awesome is that that they're able to just, do, just pay for the rest of them? Oh, it's awesome when they do it. When Michigan does it and then they give those tickets away with Cokes, people think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I see how it is. Uh, but I will say, I don't know why Ohio State's having issues, right? I mean... They're there. They're awesome. They looked good. And you're having Oregon come to town. Oregon doesn't look that good. That You'd think that that's going to be an ass kicking. Why not come see them blow out Oregon? But maybe fans think of the other way. Plus, Oregon's not going to travel. And then the other team that everyone was high on, Washington, loses to Montana. I'm not going to comment too much on it because Michigan plays them this week. And it would be the most Michigan thing to lose to them. So... <laughs> We'll come on in Washington next week. Um, but I, I think that's it for the Pac-12. UCLA, I think it's UCLA or bust. I don't think they have another team that can – I mean, USC is ranked, so is Utah. I haven't seen enough of them. Clay Helton still looks like his offense is a mess, so you can't tell me that they would be in the playoff. And even if they are, it would be a bigger beatdown than what Alabama gave Notre Dame last year. That's how much of a pretender they are. Um, you have any thoughts on the Pac-12, though? I, I think you you stated it well. Like Chip Kelly, for for as many critics as he had with what he was doing in the NFL, I, I think he really has UCLA in a good place. And and I I think they're tr- they were trolling USC after the fact to uh, to a level that that you would even be proud of. With like the change in their banner on their Twitter account to like the sissy blue shirts or something like that. Yeah, I know. It's awesome. They're ready to go. 
I think UCLA, I mean, they have a Michigan running back, Charbonnet, transferred back there to be closer to home. He's doing awesome. I mean, of course, Harbaugh knows talent, right? So, of course, that's going to be an awesome guy that they have. So why not? Why not roll with it? I think that they have, obviously, the Pac-12 has a bunch of easy games, and they just have to take care of business. They beat LSU, which Coach O has to be on the hot seat. I don't know how you can have as many scandals and allegations as he has against them and not be. But I will say they have to just win the games. They have Fresno, which I think already lost to, was it Oregon or someone? So they should be able to beat that game. And then Stanford looks awful. So that's another like game that's not as tough as what you would think. I, I think they can have at most two losses, I would think. And that would be a good year for them and potentially win the conference. If they have any less than that, if they have one or less, I think that they have a good shot at making the playoffs. I think that the playoffs committee would love to have UCLA in and Chip Kelly back in. Um, but that's all I have for that. Do you have anything else? I think unless you're an SEC school, there's no way that you're even smelling the playoffs at two losses. Well, I'm saying they would win the Pac-12 with two. I don't think they'd get in the playoffs with that. I think, and I think, and I think with a loss, unless you're you're an Ohio State one loss or SEC school, you're not getting in. No, one loss. I think this good year is already going to be messed up, and um, I don't really have anything else for the Big Ten. Uh, the big games are going to be Michigan plays Washington. Michigan should bury them. If they want to help the Big Ten uh, perception, Ohio State should bury Oregon. Penn State needs to win. Uh, and Wisconsin it did look like, them, but it's early. But it looks like Michigan actually has some competent quarterback play yet to boot. So that can be something to your advantage. Well, that's what I've been saying, and so that's the one thing where voters are down on them. And I've said this before. Um, I even saw someone that was like. I, I guess they like just hate Harbaugh, but they were saying like no coach has ever had the first six seasons exactly like this and turned it around. And then the first comment was Jim Harbaugh coming into the season had the exact same record as Dabo Sweeney at this point in his career at Clemson. The only difference was he ended up with Deshaun Watson. That was it. Like they had the exact same record. He couldn't beat Steve Spurrier until he got a competent quarterback that fit his system and could have elevated his play. If Michigan has one of those guys on the roster, and I'm not saying that it's a guarantee at this point, um, everyone thought it was going to be Milton last year. I watched him play at Tennessee, still holding onto the ball way too much. I mean, I, I don't even think, if, if I'm a Tennessee fan, I don't think you'll see Milton be the starting quarterback the entire year. Because I, so like, I don't think it's a Michigan thing. I think it's more of like recruiting misting on Harbaugh where he brings the guys in and <clears throat> excuse me, he's trying to recruit too nationally, doesn't get to see him as much. They shut down the satellite camps or whatever he was doing. He likes to see guys in person. Hasn't worked out. If he can get some accurate quarterback play, I mean they had two deep throws, two deep two different quarterbacks hit him. If that works out and he's able to elevate it, I don't see why not. It's not like the rest of the Big Ten is looking solid. Michigan misses Iowa. I mean, they have to play the Big East or the yeah the Big Ten East teams, and they play Wisconsin. I think is their big crossover game. Nebraska is the other one. Which, I mean, you're playing at Wisconsin. That's going to be the big thing. Notre Dame also plays Wisconsin, which is why you're saying if a one loss team gets in, I mean Notre Dame beat Florida State. That really doesn't raise their profile. I mean, no offense. To Florida State, but Notre Dame, how many times, you know how many times I've seen Michigan play Notre Dame earlier in the year, and I think, holy shit, Michigan's back. That was a solid game. Notre Dame's good. Only to watch Notre Dame go like 8-4. and four. Or even the years Notre Dame makes the playoffs. Michigan plays them tough, and then they get killed in the playoffs, so it's kind of like, was that fool's gold or not? Um, Notre Dame has to play USC, USC, Virginia Tech, Cincinnati, and Wisconsin I don't think they go through those five back-to-back games with with less than two losses. Just because that's one of the harder stretches that they've had recently. And so when they're out, that's when I think you see the Pac-12 have a chance to get in. 
Like I think the Big Ten, it's either Ohio State or whoever wins the Big Ten above them. Penn State, Michigan. I think Wisconsin is pretty much out of it at this time. So I guess you would say right now you have Ohio State, Penn State, then you have Iowa, and then possibly a fourth, like you said, based on quarterback play if it holds up. Possibly Michigan at this point. It's only been one game, though. Wisconsin's already out. A lot of the other Western teams are out. So um, that's the one thing. And then the ACC, I don't know what you do with them. They looked so bad as a conference across the board. Clemson came in, again, quarterback play. They went from having Deshaun Watson to Trevor Lawrence. That's two stud. I know Trevor Lawrence isn't a stud in the NFL yet, but Deshaun Watson is a top five quarterback fantasy points in the NFL. Like that's a stud quarterback that you had on your team to get you to that next level. Trevor Lawrence, overall number one pick. DJ, when he came out over the weekend, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, staring receivers down, and he basically gave the game to Georgia. The intercept interception was the difference. Staring receivers down, so he lost last year against Notre Dame doing the same exact thing. I thought we were going to see more growth from him. No. So he might Clemson might run through the ACC because they don't have any other tough games. They're playing UConn, who fired Randy Etzel. I mean, did you see that? He, well, he said he was quitting at the end of the year, and they're like, go ahead and just do it right now. Yeah, they're like, you're done. You're, you're not going to quit at the end of the year because you suck. They lost to Holy Cross and someone else. So that's Clemson's competition. Uh, their other big non-conference game besides South Carolina State and then, of course, South Carolina. So where are they really getting challenged? They play no ranked teams, Matt. So at that point, like if you're the committee, are you putting them in because of their past brand? It really depends on how Georgia does too. If Georgia ends up with three or four losses – and then Clemson has no ranked wins and a loss to a three or four loss Georgia. What do you do with them? You put Liberty in because I think Liberty's going to run the stretch. I think at that point, I think they would have to go Cincinnati or they'll just put UCLA in above them with one loss because that's where you're going to be at. It's either going to be two SEC teams. Um, I, Oklahoma's not going undefeated. I mean, that was pretty clear on the weekend. They're already set up for two SEC teams. You're either going to get A&M and Alabama or maybe a Georgia, depending on who they play. So, like, Georgia would have to go undefeated, lose to Alabama. Do they put them both in the playoffs, though? I don't know if they do that. But they do have the win over Clemson, so do they get in above Clemson? Yeah, probably. But I think the good thing is that it's we're, we're, we're only in week one. So, and I mean, That's how crazy it is. There, there's a lot to be played. So, I mean, I, I think one of the factors you got to take into play is that it's a, it's only going to get more consistent from from this point going out. So it, you're going to start to – you'll see a clearer picture of who has what because I think there was so much talent from Alabama last year with Clemson, with, with some of these other programs that you're, you're going to need to figure out who, who those top guys are. Well, that's why I wouldn't count Miami out. I mean, they have one loss, but it's two Alabama. I'm surprised they dropped them as far as they did. You can't tell me that Miami looked worse than Oklahoma. I mean, my, Oklahoma played two lane, couldn't even stop them. I mean, if it wasn't for the turnover at the end of the game, two lane would have won that game. Oklahoma wasn't going to stop them. But I guess the argument that I have with, with the Miami loss is like, as a voter, how do you look at them and say, like this is a top twenty-five team yeah. like, to get to lose by fifty to Alabama. Is that how? I don't think that was a score, was it? I mean, they scored a pile of points on them. It was so, forty-four like, to thirteen. But they could have scored like a good a gazillion. Yeah, but last time Michigan played Notre Dame, the score was like forty-two to fourteen. It was like the same exact score. Didn't really hurt Notre Dame, and it wasn't like Michigan's been world beaters. So, like, that's the why you talk about Notre Dame, how they've been in the playoffs. I honestly think it's fool's gold. They lucked out by having the ACC schedule. And the ACC, I mean, if you're being honest, those other teams haven't been recruiting 
anywhere near the Power Five. Um, someone did lay it out where if the Big 12 does add those teams that have been strong in football, BYU, Cincinnati, that have been ranked, they will easily stay ahead of the ACC and the Pac-12 in terms of recruiting rankings, in terms of performance, and even the advanced metrics. So like everyone's talking about how when Oklahoma and Texas loses or leaves the Big 12, I mean, you still have schools like Duke that's losing to, to Charlotte. Who else lost? Georgia Tech lost to Northern Illinois, which I can't say anything because Michigan plays them, so who knows how good they are. Uh, you have Louisville losing, Florida State losing, Clemson losing, Miami losing, all to pretty – I mean, some of them are top teams, but you're still losing. And North, North Carolina coming in, losing to a team that they shouldn't. So you're down you're almost your entire conference. So, like, you're saying, does a one-loss UCLA not get in the playoffs? It's like, who else are you going to put in? No one is going undefeated in the ACC. No one. Because Clemson's either going to win it with one loss or one of those other coastal teams are going to have to step up and they're not going undefeated. I mean, I would bet money on it right now. So that's one conference that's down. Big 12, not going to go undefeated. Big 10, possibly Ohio State. I think that would be the only team that could do it. Um, they've been doing it. Uh, the SEC, who cares? They're going to get two teams there. And the Pac-12, Half their team's lost in the North. They only have one undefeated team left, Oregon. And guess what? They're losing this weekend. So you're not even going to have two undefeated teams have a chance to even meet in that playoff or their conference championship. So right now, it's really UCLA or USC or one of those teams in the South that has a chance to even make the playoffs. Because if Oregon gets embarrassed by Ohio State, they're not going to get put in the playoffs. They're just going to look at it and say, you know what? We're going to put two SEC teams in. And so whether that blows up the playoff this year or not, that's what we'll see. But um, that's my last thought on it. I think in terms of like big games this weekend, the Ducks and Ohio State, I'm already picking Ohio State. And then Michigan and Wisconsin, or w- w- Washington. Is Michigan for real? Is it going to help the Big Ten by having another solid team? Washington was favored to win everywhere, but then they lost to Montana. So you only, you don't even know after this week. You don't know. And then Iowa and Iowa State, I still think Iowa's going to win. So I'm predicting a big win, a big weekend for the Big Ten. And they're going to gain ground on the SEC. And it's going to really be the SEC and the Big Ten, I think, after this weekend with the rest of those conferences trying to battle to see who else can get in that playoff conversation. Uh, but do you have anything else? No. I did have – so my thoughts on Florida State, they just looked like a poor coaching mess. I really think that Mackenzie Milton bailed them out. And I'm curious to see what they do going forward. He was limping around a lot. And so they were saying that it might have been a prior foot injury. I don't know if you caught that. Yeah. And so that might have been what was hampering him. But if Florida State comes out, they a lot of their their offensive production was on like three plays. They were negative rushing yards. I mean, like less than one yard per carry until they broke that like 80 or 90 yard rush for the touchdown yeah, on that sweep or whatever the hell they ran. So, and then there was another big play. It was a passer. I think they're all runs, right? So like they were just pounding, pounding, not doing anything. And then they would have, they would move the ball and then it would seem like, Hey, you have some, you have some stuff on the outside where you're able to get around Notre Dame's guys. What are you doing in the rest of the time? I almost got the impression from watching it that it looked like the offensive line was so accustomed to, to Jordan Travis scrambling and, and running and breaking down once the the rush got there because it looked like two different offensive lines. Like when he was out there, there were a lot of times it looked like he had no time to pass. Like he'd be getting the ball and there'd already be guys in his face. But then Mackenzie Milton comes out and all of a sudden – the offensive line suddenly remembers to pass block, and they they move the ball right down the field. It was like they're like, "Oh crap, we got we got Milton. He only got one good leg. We got we got to protect him." Well, that's the one thing where I think if they roll with him, I think he's more traditional, and I think that's the kind of offense Norvell wants to run. I think that that's his more of his style, and I think that that's why it, it probably just looked better because that's what they've been kind of coaching. Now, if they stick with them, that's one thing. If they're worried about the injuries or whatever, 
because like I wouldn't blame them if they were spooked. But now you're looking at, I mean, this has to be Milton's last year, right? Yes. He didn't play since Obama was president. Did you know that? I did know that. He's a national champion. Yeah. But he was hurt before that game, wasn't he? No, I think he I think he quarterbacked them. I don't know. I can't remember. I, I know it was like right around that time. But he got hurt and then that was it. And so now are they gonna roll with them? Or are they not? Because the schedule, like I said, there are so many weak teams in the ACC that's like, what's Syracuse even doing? Like someone had said that Boston College was against West Virginia joining the ACC still. It's like who is even listening to Boston College? What do they bring to the ACC? Like, if you were at the meeting of Boston College, it's like, eh, excuse me, sir. I don't think we should get West Virginia in here. I think, like, Florida State and Clemson would be like, shut the hell up. Like, we don't even need you. <laughs> we would rather kick you out and have West Virginia and have some competence on the other Atlantic side. Or, no, the coastal side, I mean. Because that's basically the Big East side. And I think they should rebalance at that, where they just get rid of, like, North Carolina and put West Virginia there. And uh, who else needs to switch? I guess Boston College and Louisville, and just make it the Big East side. You could just call it the East versus um, the Atlantic to make it very clear. Because like Miami, (laughs) (laughs) Pitt, Virginia Tech, like all those old Big East schools out of West Virginia, like why not? That's I think that that's where they should go. I don't know if West Virginia is going to leave though, because like I said, the projections are showing that that new conference of the Big Twelve is going to have the power. I just don't know. But Florida State, I mean, you have a chance. You can't lose to UNC. They looked bad. Can't lose that game. You need to be able to just run all over them like Virginia Tech did. And then, like Miami, the big one's Florida, which I did see. So ESPN and their contradictions. Michigan's going to be so bad that they're going to fire Harbaugh at the end of the year. But just so you know, they're going to play on January 1st against Florida in their annual rivalry bowl game. I'm like, you have have Florida ranked 13th. How the hell will we be playing Florida in the bowl game if Farball's also getting fired? <laughs> like, <what> because it <laughs> doesn't make any they're sense. Already, they're already banking on Florida losing a couple games and throwing shoes at people. Yeah, but then why would we be playing on January 1st? Why wouldn't that game be like uh, the pinstripe bowl or something? Like, you'd think that they would mix it up. They're not going to put two like seven-win teams against each other on New Year's, but who knows? Maybe they will. They'll say, get, get on out there. Uh, but Florida's ranked 13th, so... That's the one thing where it's like, again? Again, really? Like, we can never play Georgia, right? They, <laughs> Georgia never wins anything. They're always available. They're always available to play. We've never played them. At least I don't think so. Florida, South Carolina, when they were winning the, the uh, east side, Michigan always found a way to play them. Oh, I did have one other thing to, to talk about. My final bell, Matt. My game of the week for this week. NC State, Mississippi State. My man Mike Leach was getting roasted on Saturday. Did you see? Yeah. They were almost losing, and I thought, he always has a bonehead game where I think it's early in the season, quarterback's not comfortable with the reads. Uh, not, I mean, when you're running the air raid, you're getting a lot of three and outs, three and outs, your defense is getting tired. But then in the second half, your talent takes over, and your conditioning, which should be superior because you have more depth, and then they came back and won. In the past, at Washington State, he didn't have that level of depth, and they would have lost those games. NC State came out, and they ran the ball all over South Florida, which South Florida is a shell of the program it used to be. So now I'm looking at this, and I'm wondering, if you're looking for a game to watch, I'm going to look it up to see. I don't even know if it's on TV. It's on ESPN2 on the 11th. Is that Saturday? Or is that Friday? I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't. Oh, no, I do have a counter on my phone. Hold on. Let me just double check. Because if it's Friday, I mean, you watch. No, it is Saturday. I thought it was Saturday. Oh, yeah, because the Steelers are playing on the 12th. I was getting confused because I knew we just talked about a game on the 12th, but that was the Steelers game. So Saturday night, 7 p.m., get your two TVs set up. Watch Michigan and Washington on one. Watch NC State and Mississippi State on the other. And then you can kind of see... 63% are picking for NC State. If NC State blows this game, then the, like I said, the ACC is going to be like, 
Oh, my gosh. We don't even have any marquee wins. Mississippi State was struggling with, was it L.A. Tech? Or no, just, yeah, Louisiana Tech. Yeah. So And they won by one point at the end of the game. It was the largest comeback. Mike Leach owns the largest comeback, I think, at three different schools, Matt, because of how his offense runs. So it's part of his resume. <laughs> I don't know how bad the schools are that they've won against, but that's my final bell. Watch that game on Saturday. We'll be talking about it next week. Do you have anything else? Yeah. If For those of you who can't be at the game on Thursday, if you're watching from home and you notice that, they're, that the Bulldogs are not in our blue uniforms, don't be alarmed. We are partnering with the United States Army and getting the camo jerseys for this game. So it's kind of a cool partnership getting some military support and appreciation. Uh, had, a, had a presentation today with the kids, and we're going to be excited to rock the military fatigues. Does that mean that um, you'll be giving me some camo Claysburg gear? That is a negative. We are returning said gear to the Army after, the, after our game. So you don't even get any swag from that deal? We do. We get to be on TV with outstanding uniforms. Because um, I did see some of the quarterbacks. I've, I don't know who it was, but they're now they're signing autographs for a hundred dollars an autograph, and I thought that's a that's a fake deal. No one's paying a hundred dollars for like the backup quarterback, or I think it was like the quarterback of Georgia. No one's paying a hundred dollars for his signature, unless he wins a national championship. No one's going to pay for that. So you're kind of like hedging your bets. They said that the goal is to sell each autograph for a thousand dollars. That's a lie. Who the hell is going to pay for that? And why? That's my last final bell thing. So uh, check out Matt's game on Thursday. If there's anything you want us to talk about, um, let us know, and we'll see you next week.